Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. It is indeed a, a great pleasure that I have uh, to be able to bring a message to you this Sabbath. Um, some churches might be playing it at different times, but it's good to get a word out across the conference in the midst of this corona um, quarantine that we're in. So many different people are hurting and suffering, not only because of the disease, but because of the effects of the disease. I can assure you that on a daily basis, the pastors of this conference have been putting up a wall of prayer around all our people, asking for the greatest blessings possible to be given to you. And there are so many things that we're learning. Um, we have learned great things. We as a church certainly are ad more adaptable than we thought we were. And I mean that in the best possible way. We've learned to do things across the board that five, six weeks ago we didn't think could be done. But at the same time, we're learning things about the, the world we live in. We're learning about government. We're learning about their response and how they treat the church. And so there's a whole lot of lessons to learn. And at some point in time, I, I plan to write something when I can articulate it and think these things through a little bit more. It's kind of a uh, a lot of information that's been downloaded and now it needs to be sorted out. The one thing I am assured of is that God is going to bless us. He's going to strengthen us. And the mission of his church is not going to stop. Fortunately, God has blessed us with a very strong conference. And we're working as hard as, as we can to keep everything together. And we plan to, to come out of this as strong as we possibly can. That's how we're looking and working at it right now. And so before I go into my sermon, just know that daily I am praying. Our pastors are praying. I know many of you have become greater people of prayer throughout this time. And we're going to be stronger. I am convinced of that. We are going to be able to show the mission of the church in a way that uh, we haven't been able to work at before. I think that the really good things are going to happen for us. And so may God continue to bless the churches of the Southern New England Conference, and may he strengthen us to give us greater hope, greater anticipation of his return, and that we'll be joyfully waiting for him to return back to this earth. Now, the word I want to bring today comes... comes as a time when um, this was supposed to be our unified Sabbath across the, the, uh, the conference, and so we're going to keep it as best we can as a unified Sabbath. Uh, the theme of this year's unified Sabbath was to be 2020 vision, helping our communities to see a clear vision of Jesus. And our scripture text for this unified Sabbath was from Luke, or is from Luke, Chapter 24, verse 31, when it says, and Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. This was the guys that were on the road to Emmaus. They thought that they had lost out on something great that Jesus had done. But Jesus began to teach them from the scriptures all the things concerning the Christ and God's Messiah, and how he must suffer and die. And when they understood from God's word these things, their eyes were opened. And so thus started the mission of the church, and it always starts with a clear vision of Jesus. And since this is the year 2020, and 2020 is also a number that's used to talk about our eyesight, I thought it would be a good theme that 2020, we want a clear vision of Jesus, because in our goal to serve Jesus, we are serving his mission to take the good news to the world. And for us, that means to bring the gospel to our communities and for the hearts of people who will be attracted to Jesus. It's our responsibility to make Jesus beautiful for them. We need to demonstrate his love. We need to demonstrate his mercy. And so today I want to focus 
on the love that Jesus has for you. I hope your response from this will be to show his love to people who do not know him. And I'm going to try today by looking, um, looking at the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness to see that love that he has for us, that time that he spent in the desert was for you and for me. Now, we've all been going through the, the quarantine, and the root definition of quarantine is 40 days. Jesus spent those 40 days in the wilderness, and so while we're going through our quarantine, we're going to look at the time when Jesus went through his quarantine. Now, the story of Jesus going into the wilderness really starts with his baptism by John the Baptist. When Jesus came up out of the water, there was a voice from heaven. The dove came down upon him. The Holy Spirit was there. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The words that the Lord chose to declare Jesus as the Son of God, were not randomly picked words. These words, this statement, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased, is a combination of two very important Old Testament texts. The first phrase, this is my beloved Son, is a reference in, to Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 is a um, beautiful psalm that I'll get into in just a moment, the second part of the phrase, this is my beloved son, is taken from Isaiah chapter 42. Now, both Psalm 2 and Isaiah 42 are both messianic passages in the Old Testament. They speak specifically to the work and the mission of God's Messiah. Um, psalm number 2 takes some time to read it. It's a short psalm. If you read that psalm, you see that the Messiah is spoken of as a conquering king. He is the one who eventually destroys all wickedness, all evil. And he sits upon the throne as a victorious king. This is a beautiful vision of Jesus, him overcoming all the evil, all the wickedness of this world, and one day will sit on the throne as a victorious king king. In Isaiah 42, that's found in the midst of a larger section of Isaiah. If you go from Isaiah chapter 40 through Isaiah chapter 53, you'll read that there's the servant of the Lord that is spoken of. It, it's, it's a beautiful um, set of scriptures that speaks to the Lord's Messiah as a servant. And throughout all those chapters, the servant of God perfectly obeys the will of God at every instance. And when he lives the will of God, eventually the, the wickedness of the world then comes upon him. He is unjustly um, he is unjustly punished for the sins of others. In Isaiah 53, we finally read about how he is pierced through for our transgressions. By his stripes, we are healed. The servant of Isaiah 40 through 53, the son in whom he's well pleased, is the one who eventually dies in the place of wicked humanity. He does so as the obedient lamb of God. So when the Lord declared from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, the Lord was sending a message to Jesus and he was sending a message to all of us that Jesus is his Messiah. But as his Messiah, he would have two roles to perform. One, he would be the victorious king. He would be the one who would overthrow all evil. Also, he would be the, the servant the obedient servant who would faithfully execute the will of God at every step till finally he would die in the place of wicked humanity. Now, when Jesus was baptized, he came out of the water. This voice comes from heaven. Thou art my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. 
what would he do? Would he first be the king, the victorious king, or would he be the obedient sermon, uh, servant? Now, the popular view of the day, the one that would have got him to be readily accepted, was to be the avenging king, to put down the wicked Romans, or would he go and become the obedient servant first and die in the place of wicked humanity? Matthew 4 provides the answer, and then it says that as the Holy Spirit came upon him, he was led by the Spirit, and it led him out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So after coming up out of the waters of baptism, Jesus doesn't march to Jerusalem and become the king. In fact, he goes 180 degrees in the opposite direction. He goes out into the wilderness where he would be the servant, the servant of God and the servant of God's people. Now, as he's in the wilderness, as Jesus enters into his quarantine, he's tested by the devil, and he's tested specifically on whether he is the true servant of God. The devil says to him, if you are the son of God, this phrase, son of God, he, it is a messianic phrase. If you are this Messiah, if you are this servant, then I command you, turn these stones into bread. Now, the voice had just declared him to be the son of God, and Jesus is following the pathway of being a servant. This temptation is not just a random temptation. It is calculated by the devil to try to test his messiahship. Is Jesus going to be the true servant of God? Now, this temptation to turn stones into bread seems very casual. It seems very benign. Well, what's the big deal about turning stones into bread? I mean, it would be a big deal to you or me, but for Jesus, it it's, wouldn't have been a big deal. But when we realize at the time, at the time of Christ, there were lots of messianic expectations. And the people had an expectation concerning their Messiah. And one of those expectations was that when the Messiah arrived, he would provide a messianic banquet. The idea of a banquet being a time when there would be great abundance of food. The messianic meal would be, this messianic banquet would be a symbolic um, sign that the Messiah had arrived and that he had taken control and that the people no longer had to suffer. Now, during his ministry, Jesus was very sensitive to this expectation of the messianic banquet and what it meant to the people. We have two examples in the stories of the Gospels of where Jesus provided an abundance of food, and the most food that he provided was bread. He fed 4,000 people, and then another time he fed 5,000 people, and the, the bread was the one thing that was common and that people had an abundance. So much so, we're told that the disciples were able to pick up 12 basketfuls of bread after everybody had eaten. Now, in the story, as it's told in the Gospel of John, John informs us that when Jesus had fed the 5,000 people, it says very specifically that the people wanted to make Jesus their king. So when the people saw Jesus create this miracle of providing bread for the people, what did they see? They saw the Messiah. So this temptation to turn stones into bread is a, is a temptation for Jesus to become, to just show himself, to be the Messiah. Now, we're told in Revelation 19 about the Messianic banquet. He would provide a Messianic banquet for his people, and it's called in Revelation 19 the marriage supper of the Lamb. In that meal, as it's portrayed in Revelation 19, it's a, it's a meal of victory, 
for Jesus, for his people. And that, and it's at that meal that we see that the plan of salvation has come true, that the plan to take us from a world of sin and suffering and sickness and bring us into a world that's made new, bright, and beautiful. This is what the Messianic banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb is. So when Jesus is tempted by the devil to turn stones into bread, what the devil is tempting Jesus to do is to provide for the Messianic banquet. Jesus is, uh, is being tempted to take on the privilege, to take on the power, to take on the rights of the victorious Messiah. Jesus is being tempted to be a victorious kingly Messiah, but, but, before he became the servant Messiah. He's being tempted to become the king before he became the servant on the cross. Satan is tempting Jesus to go away from the pathway of a servant who dies for the people and just become a king. Now, we know that after the first temptation, Jesus is confronted by the devil with a second temptation, and the, and the devil is very sly. He's very tricky in this temptation because Jesus has just stated that he will trust in only the word of God. Thus, the devil brings a quote from Scripture to him, and he takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, and there Satan says to him, if you are the Son of God, see again the messianic expectation, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Because it is written in God's word, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, they will lift you up before you strike your foot against a stone. That's from Psalm 91. Verses 11 and 12. Again, notice the phrase, Son of God. Satan is tempting Jesus' Messiahship, tempting whether he is a, going to be a true Messiah. And the, the Old Testament quote used by the devil is a, is a beautiful psalm, Psalm 91. We quote it today. We use it today when we find ourselves in a very difficult situation it is very common for us to claim the promises of Psalm 91. It speaks of the protection that God will give to his believer, how God will generously give a covering to his people. And he, the promise is even there that if we are falling to the ground, that the angels themselves will catch and pick the believer up before their feet hit the ground. Now let's try to picture this scene for a moment. Let's try to picture this temptation. Satan has brought Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. The pinnacle of the temple, the, the archaeologists tell us that this pinnacle stood approximately 150 feet above the ground. That would have been above the courtyard of the temple structure. It would have even been much further down to the ground on the other side of the temple to the base of the Kidron Valley. And now Jesus is brought to the pinnacle of the, the, the temple. He's 150 feet high. And let us try to envision this. Satan has just told him, okay, you trust in the word of God. So why don't you just jump? Jump. His word says that if you fall, if you are falling to the ground, his angels will come and catch you even before your feet will touch the ground. So jump, Jesus. Just jump. Now, let's speculate just a little bit further. Jesus is on the pinnacle. He, in his heart, believes fully in the word of God. He had every reason to believe that God would send angels to catch him if he jumped, and that before his feet touched the ground, he would be caught up by the, by the angels. Now, 
we are Hebrew worshipers in the temple court. And all of a sudden we hear a scream and a shout to look. And what do we see? We see there hovering in the midair, in the midst of the air, we see Jesus hovering in the air, surrounded by angels, because God didn't allow his feet to hit the ground. What other time do we have a picture where Jesus is in the air, surrounded by angels, and his feet don't touch the ground? Well, Seventh-day Adventists, this is, this is easy for us. We know this is the picture of Jesus at his second coming. We are told that Jesus will come in the air. He will be surrounded by angels. The heavenly host will be around him. So thus, by bringing Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and daring him, tempting him to jump, the devil is tempting Jesus to duplicate his second coming. But he's tempting him to duplicate his second coming before finishing up the work of his first coming. To put it, as I said, with the first temptation, Satan is tempting Jesus to be a kingly, victorious Messiah without fulfilling the role of being the servant Messiah who would die in the place of God's people, the one who would die for the sins of God's people. To put it another way, Satan was tempting Jesus to do the second advent before he finished up the work of the first advent. Satan was tempting Jesus to not go to the cross. Now let's talk about the third temptation. We're told that Jesus is taken to a very high mountain. And in some supernatural manner, Jesus is shown every kingdom of the earth. He's shown all these kingdoms, their beauty, their glory. He is able to see everything. And the devil tells him that all these kingdoms will be his. And the one thing, the only one thing that he has to do is to bow down and worship Satan. Now, Satan obviously had some sort of power that could be attractive. He was able to supernaturally show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. So the temptation is real that he can, he can do great things for Jesus. Now, in the first two temptations, Jesus' messiahship was being tempted. Satan was tempting Jesus to be a victorious king before Jesus fulfilled the role of the servant messiah. And it's safe to assume that this third temptation concerns the same issue. This is why he's promising him to be a king of all the earth without going to the cross. But let's examine some verses from Revelation 19 again. Revelation 19 verse 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire in his head, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. Verse 13, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Psalm 2. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh he has written the name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
these verses speak of Jesus. They portray the one day when he will be the victorious. He will be the kingly Messiah who rules over all peoples and nations of this earth. Just what Satan was promising him. The whole world is Jesus's in Revelation 19, and he has this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So there will be a time when Jesus will rule over all the kingdoms of the world. There will be a time when all people recognize him as the rightful leader. But notice the details. We're told to notice the robe. His robe was dipped in blood. Jesus can only assume, Jesus can only take on the title of King of Kings and Lord of Lords because his blood is spilled on that robe. It was his blood that was spilled at Calvary. It was the manifestation of his blood that he pled in the courts of heaven on our behalf. So again, in this third temptation, Satan is tempting Jesus to be a king before he fulfilled his role as a servant, before he would be the servant who would die for our sins. We often simplify these temptations. We simplify them too much when we simply talk about Jesus as overcoming the lust of diet, overcoming pride with his eyes and covetousness, in Matthew chapter 4, this quarantine of Jesus, this 40 days in the wilderness, it's much deeper and it's much greater. The, the issues at hand were the salvation of you, me, and this world. Plainly stated, Satan was tempting Jesus to stay away from Calvary. Satan was trying to get Jesus to change his mind to give up on his calling to be the servant Messiah of Isaiah 53, the one who would die for the sins of the people, the one by whom stripes we are healed. Satan wanted Jesus to take the glory and take the pride of being a victorious king, a respected king. He wanted Jesus to do this without going down the pathway of shame, the pathway of humiliation, without him going down the pathway of disgrace, without him going down the pathway of dying as a common criminal on a bloodstained cross. The issue at stake in all three temptations was our salvation. And Jesus continually chose not to be a king, but he chose the way of humiliation to be the servant. He chose humiliation over exaltation. He chose to be despised instead of being worshipped. He chose to be the one who was rejected instead of being the one who was accepted. Our Lord did this because he loves you. People every day every moment of every day, are dying a physical death, but many of them will die an eternal death because they have never been shown a clear vision of Jesus. They've never seen how beautiful his love is for us. Jesus quarantined in the wilderness and he came out committed to teach the truth of the Heavenly Father. To teach the beauty of our Heavenly Father. I challenge us on our unified Sabbath to let us come out of our quarantine stronger, more committed, more in love with Jesus, more in love with people who do not know Jesus so that they can see a clear clear, crystal clear vision of who Jesus is through our acts of compassion 
our words of grace and our merciful attitudes in our church families. Jesus did this because he is deeply in love with us. Can we not please take this message of love and share it with other people? Come out of our quarantine stronger and ready to share the love of God. I so thank you for taking the time to listen today. Again, we pray each day for God's Holy Spirit in your heart. And we pray for the protection of those angels to keep us all safe and healthy and close to the heart of Jesus. Thank you, and may God bless you.